So good afternoon and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this conference and uh, I really enjoy being here. It's uh, one of my first experiences to a conference with people coming from really different uh, uh, subjects and I think that is uh, a great opportunity, at least from my point of view, I'm learning really a lot. Uh, I will present different works that I'm doing, uh, mostly I will concentrate on this last uh, work that is with Monica Biglio, that is a colleague of mine at the University of Venice, Milek and Bansky from uh, UMass, and then Dale Grade from IMF, uh, Andrew Lowe from MIT, and Robert Merton from MIT too. Uh, well, the, the main topic here is uh, on trying to see how connectedness and uh, uh, let's say the kind of uh, ne system networks that it, we are going to observe in the sovereign and uh, banking and uh, insurance market in Europe is going to build up. It is really a preliminary work, so there is not even a paper. I will be very pleased for all the comments that you are providing. Uh, we have mostly a lot of questions on our result rather than uh, answer on all the different issues that has been addressed today. But before to go on this uh, uh, topic, I would like to start with, uh, in terms of background, on a previous work that I did with, uh, again, with Monica Biglio, Mila Getmansky, and Drew Lowe, uh, and it has been published in the Journal of Financial Economics, uh, where the topic was measuring systemic risk. And uh, actually, maybe I don't need to talk about this definition, but uh, uh, today we talk a lot about systemic risk, and again, even in terms of definition of what is systemic risk, we didn't agree. Um, the, the way in which we define systemic risk in our paper was any set of circumstances that threatens the stability or the public confidence in the financial system. And I can tell you that we do have a lot of problem with this definition with the referee, because usually, you know, the definition of systemic risk is uh, uh, a spillover of losses among, uh, uh, or defaults among different financial institutions. So clearly, what this have to do with uh, this definition? But we really think that if we want to talk about systemic risk, we need to uh, use a more broad perspective and try to see really what is going on when uh, the system is not working. Um, so in some way, the idea is that uh, clearly systemic risk is based on um, uh, a series of multi-factors events that happens at the same time for some reason. And clearly, uh, you cannot have only a single measure that captures systemic risk. We need more than one systemic risk because, uh, uh, more than one measure, because clearly what we are going to observe through times also uh, on all these different crises and, and so on can be generated by different channels that uh, shows up in the same way. Um, and again, you know, uh, the idea that you need more than one measure is because uh, measuring stability is on the other side and public confidence still is very difficult. Uh, but what we think is in some way linking all the different measures that we can provide on systemic risk is that one key point is to measure connect, connect, connections and interaction among the different uh, financial stakeholders. Uh, so clearly the most important thing is to measure these kind of linkages and the connectivity of the mar market participants and I think that in all the previous talks, there was really this attempt to try to measure how uh, at the same time, so at the cross-sectional level and through times, there is this kind of linkages. Um, on the other side, you know, we start with the observation that we do have an increase in interconnectedness uh, of financial institutions. And when we are talking about financial institutions, again, we use a broad approach. So we're not just talking about banks. But we do have in mind also hedge funds, brokers, and insurance companies. Actually, insurance companies most of the time are not uh, considered as a relevant, uh, systemically important institutions. We decide to include them in our analysis because we think that it is important to include them in this picture. And um, so the main purpose is to try to measure the degree of interconnectedness between these financial institutions. Uh, what we try to do in this paper is to provide a series of econometric measures of systemic risk to capture these kind of linkages and therefore the level of vulnerabilities of the financial system. And uh, on the other side, we want really to try to identify systemically important institutions. 
and how, on the other side, uh, we can observe through time the building up of systemic risk prior to the crisis. Because uh, as uh, uh, we learned just in the previous talk, clearly systemic risk and when we saw the crisis and the blow up is just the end of what's happened before. So the kind of connection and uh, you know, uh, linkages that it has been built up before, then then uh, will be in some way shows up during the uh, systemic risk crisis. So this is why, for example, even before I was asking, how do you build up a bubble that in some way is creating the conditions to get a systemic risk uh, effect later on. Uh, why then talk also about networks? Well, uh, if we are talking about the word systemic risk, clearly the key point is the system, the presence of a system. And so clearly when we're talking about systemic risk, we're talking about something where the risk is starting endogenously on the structure of the system. This is different from systematic risk, where systematic risk is just some exogenous factors, risk factor, that will affect all the financial institutions in, this, in different ways, but is, well, the source of risk is uh, outside the system. Uh, what we are trying really to figure out is how the structure of the system uh, can favorite the building up of uh, the systemic risk and so how endogenously in some way the risk will propagate in the system. And I think that uh, uh, given all the different talks of today, I, I'm really happy that this idea of endogeneity is of uh, uh, the risk that will uh, be generated in a systemic risk framework is something that has been stressed quite a lot even before. And usually in the other presentation, in the other conference, this is something that has not been stressed enough. Um, so on the other side, if you're talking about a system, we need to map this system. And clearly, we need to try to find some ways to measure connection among the different financial institutions. Uh, on the other side, it will be very nice to know how one institution will be affected by the others and will affect the others, and how dynamically this kind of causality will change through times. Uh, so what we are trying really to, to use is network structure uh, measures. So starting from the idea that network structures matters in understanding how the risk has been built up endogenously in a system. Uh, and clearly, it is strictly connected, we know already many times today it has been stressed, by short-term finance and let's say leverage and so on. And, uh, uh, in a cluster structure, clearly, different groups of financial institutions with the same portfolio can default together for different, you know, uh, kind of, uh, of spillovers. We do so this example this, uh, uh, today, and clearly on the other side, uh, if you have an unclustered structure, defaults are more dispersed. So this is why, you know, starting also from the point of view of the, of the regulatory reform, uh, we need to provide some measure of systemic risk that capture the linkages among the different uh, uh, institutions that belong to the financial system and how much their vulnerabilities will be spread around in the system. Um, on the other side, we can clearly monitor the overall level of risk of the system and also try to figure out who are uh, the institutions that are more systemically important in, the, in this framework. Looking also to capital requirement, Basel III and so on, and macro, uh, let's say, uh, monitoring of risk and so on, again, the issue of systemic risk and interconnectedness, it is something that is being at least in included in the agenda, even if we are still, you know, working at the microeconomic levels rather than at the macroeconomic level. So how do we con contribute in this way? Well, we produce a series of uh, systemic risk uh, uh, measure based mostly on statistical properties of aggregate market returns for hedge funds, brokers, insurance companies, and banks. I'm not going to stress all these different points. I'm just going straight to the result that uh, we are going to uh, obtain with this uh, work. I'm just 
uh, we do use different measures, so principal components that capture correlation, linear Granger causality test, uh, and no linear Granger causality test. I will concentrate one minute now just on the linear Granger causality test uh, that in some way is helping us to build up uh, the network structure. So it's capture the directionalities of the commonality and the signal uh, of market dysfunctioning. Um, the measure that we use is very simple. So we're not going to use very, very uh, strange measure. Uh, what is the idea of a Granger causality test? It's very simple. After controlling, we do control also for heteroscedasticity and so on. Assuming that the XT is just uh, uh, the return of a company, a certain company X, uh, we are clearly linking this return to past return of this company, let's say a bank or an edge fund, and uh, the previous returns of some other institutions. And then we have, you know, the error term. We do it also, we add some common factors. So you, let's say you can also add uh, uh, the stock market returns. You can add also the FAMA and French factors with legs and so on. Uh, we did the same for the other kind of institutions. And then check if this coefficient is statistically different than zero. Yeah. So AIG was a very important problem mm -hmm. in 2008. And we know now that AIG gives uh, a lot of people have exposures to AIG because they yes. insurance, first of all, so and something. And if AIG went down, all these guys would have lost big money. Yeah. So they were very uh, scared of this thing. Uh, so there was a high degree of connectedness between AIG and all these banks. Hmm? But this, this was unknown to the general market. Only the guy who bought insurance knew that. So if you look at the market returns of AIG and these financials, I don't think you would see anything before 2008. You will see, okay. So <laughs> let's go on. You do fine, okay. So uh, we are using AG is one of, I will show you really AG here. So it's a good question. So the focus is again on hedge funds, banks, brokers, and uh, insurance. Uh, and clearly why insurance is because again, they move to a different business and they are in some way becoming uh, to be similar to banks and so on. And the banking industry has been, you know, doing something that is more similar to what hedge funds are doing, so leverage and blah, blah, blah. So this is the network. As you say, we shouldn't find anything. And I was expecting to find anything by, you know, just measuring this Granger causality of, we are using one other institutions, 25 top banks, 25 top hedge funds in terms of size, 25 top insurances and 25 top uh, brokers and use a rolling windows of 36 months to estimate uh, this uh, Granger causality, let's say, test. So we are looking to this beta and we control in the background for uh, standard and poor, leg standard and poor, FAMA and French factors and so on. So this is the kind of number of connection that we find for this period, uh, January 94, December 96. And, uh, you know, the, the blue are the banks, black are the insurers, red are the hedge funds, and, and green are the, uh, the brokers. Clearly, it can be just a, a, um, an error in the measurement because here the p-value is 5%. So clearly, it could be that we are finding this just by chance. But if you're moving uh, on 2008, this is the number of connections that you find. So clearly, you cannot get them just by chance. And as you can see, the black one are the insurances, and the blue one are the banks. And uh, I can show, I, clearly it is in the paper, but just to convince you that, uh, uh, you know, clearly, this one, the one that is starting with this black here is AG. Uh, but you say, okay, you are including already AG there. But if you move before, even August or uh, April, you still see this kind of pattern. And actually, if I'm using data on 2005, okay, so I'm mapping this kind of connection in 2005, where I'm including GM. So when there was, you know, this problem in the already in the uh, in the financial system, and I'm looking to the losses that you can find during the period of the from 2007 till 2008. So how much 
these 100 institutions lose money from their value at the end of uh, June 2007 and at the end of uh, um, December 2008. I'm ranking them and I'm looking to their level of leverage in 2005 the level of uh, exposure to the principal components, uh, so how much they were correlated with each other. And then I'm using my measure of, you know, the classical measure of connection based on network measure, let's say the number of in and out, and also closeness and eigenvector centrality. So how central is an institution based on this kind of, uh, of connection? Well, as you can see, it is highly significant and clearly this is not coming from, you know, the level of correlation, how much I'm contemporaneously correlated with the other in 2005, or how much is my leverage in 2005. But it's also relevant how I'm relevant in this financial system among these other, let's say, 99 institutions. So I changed this morning the title of these slides because given the talk that, uh, you know, we have on uh, uh, if structure matters more than strategies, well, clearly, at least it seems that structure matters as strategies in explaining how risky you are in the system. But, you know, uh, we did also some analysis again showing that uh, using just measure at the microeconomic level, so using, for example, classical measure of, uh, um, let's say, mass or the delta covar, and using our measure of networks, in this case I change a different uh, sample, I use a different sample period, I'm using the same one as Acharya and Peterson are using, still, you know, network measure are able to predict losses better or at, at least in a comp complementary ways as mass or delta covar. So the key, let's say the story that you can pick up from these results is that uh, uh, the way in which you are included in a system and how much you are playing a role in terms of interconnectness, interconnection that are not just built up by contemporaneous co correlations do matters in explaining how much you will lose during crisis. No, 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 this is not in sample. No, 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 this is not in sample. With Delta know. Covar, the problem with Delta Covar is that it has absolutely no out of sample predictability. No, this is out of sample. This is, you know, I'm using the Delta Covar of these institutions in, uh, I think, uh, uh, in this case it was weekly data, I used the one in May 2007 to predict losses later on during the crisis. So this is out of, everything is out of sample here. Okay? But now I would like to move, yes. Sorry? What's the, what's the of MES? Of MES, marginal expected shortfall. Okay. Yeah, is the one, uh, you know, proposed for, uh, that is clearly contemporaneous correlation, so it's, uh, it's not something different. So I'm not surprised that we are having this kind of result. But clearly the question, the main question that uh, in some way we have is, how could be that at the frequency of one month we are able to capture this kind of, uh, you know, linkages. So this is why, you know, almost to everybody this morning I was asking, do you, are you able to explain to me something in terms of dynamic on how, you know, this risk has been, you know, spread around in the system and what is the frequency? Uh, because most of your works, at least what I understand, it was based on few hours or few days. But what I'm capturing here is something that will be spread out in, with a frequency that is one month or maybe more. So really, I'm not able to understand if, uh, clearly you should have a sort of cascade or some, some uh, let's say, uh, slow effect that will apply for a long period. Uh, this is what, you know, is coming out from uh, this empirical evidence. So now we move on, what are we observing if we apply this kind of measures to what is going on in Europe? So in this case, we are looking to banks, insurances, and, uh, and sovereign. And again, we are trying to co measure connectness in the system network. What is the objective? Well, clearly, the risk of the banking and insurance system have become clearly increasingly interconnected with sovereign risk. Um, 
We want clearly to know what kind of interconnection we do have among different countries and financial institutions. And also we want to consider both explicit and implicit connection. And uh, uh, on clearly this kind of connection clearly are coming for sure from asset and liability mismatches again that there are within and across all these different countries and financial institutions. What is the methodology? Well, we propose in this case as a first thing to measure and analyze the, this kind of interconnection between these different financial institutions and sovereign uh, using contingent claim analysis, that is, there's, so data provided by Moody's mostly, and then network theory. Why? Well, again, because the existing methods of measuring financial stabilities have been heavily criticized mostly by Segoviano and Godard and say that clearly in order to have a good measure of systemic stability, you need to have two different components. The first one is the probability that an individual financial institution on country defaults. And clearly, we can argue that our return measure is highly related on the probability of default, but maybe if you're using, uh, let's say, expected losses or something like this, is still more related on these probabilities. And then the probability and speed of possible shocks spreading through the industry and the countries need to be measured. Uh, on the other side, we know that most policy efforts have not focused in a comprehensive way on assessing network externalities, uh, not clearly in all the wars that we saw today, but you know, most of the time we are just looking to the individual and see what is going on, and we are not really capturing the externalities that the behavior of a single institution or one country can generate on, uh, on the, let's say, the probability of default of the other countries. And then clearly it is important to map the interconnectedness between financial institutions, financial markets, and sovereign countries. And again, what are the implications of the structure of this system, so the structure of this network, uh, and the kind of linkages that you have in this system on systemic risk, so on the fragility of the system. Again, we think that the size and the level of interconnectedness and the complexity of the, the individual financial institutions uh, and, their, and therefore their interrelationships uh, uh, also with sovereign risk can create vulnerabilities at the systemic level. And uh, so we propose as a first thing to use expected loss value based on contingent claim analysis and jointly network measure to analyze the financial system and the interaction uh, among all these different institutions. So sovereign, banks, and insurances. What is behind the, uh, this approach? Well, it is very simple, assuming that you have uh, the classical asset and liabilities. So you have asset, equity, and risky debt. The value of the liabilities clearly are related to the value of the asset. Liabilities do present different seniorities, and we know that the asset is clearly subject to shocks and randomness. So the result that we have is that the asset is just the equity plus the risky debt, and when we are talking about the risky debt, we are talking about the default-free debt minus the expected loss value. So we concentrate on this expected loss value, and uh, uh, the liabilities in this case derive its value from the value of the asset using the classical Black and Shields formula. Assets are clearly stochastics, and uh, we think that it is a very good thing if we are able to have uh, a sort of measure of the asset that is a forward-looking measure, so it's able to tell us uh, also what is the present value of all the future cash flow uh, that this uh, uh, institution is, is in some way generating, and then we can get the risky debt that is clearly the default-free debt minus the expected loss value, and all the element that has been in some way used to this calculation is the asset value at time zero, the default barrier for the loss, the volatility of the asset, and clearly how much is uh, that is strictly related to the debt and the time horizon and the risk-free rate that we are using. So we are using data from KMV, Credit Hedge, that uh, is producing this expected loss ratio by looking to equity, extracting from the equity the risk-neutral probability measure of default, and then multiply this risk neutral probability with the loss given default that they are extracting historically from the different sectors. 
And given this expected loss ratio, they can also calculate the fair value of the CDS spread. Because clearly, if everything is working and is uh, connected, then the fair value of the CDS spread should be related to this uh, measure. Uh, why are we deciding to use expected loss value? Well, because we think that uh, uh, just using CDS measure, so CDS uh, price, uh, given on one side that this market is not so liquid and we don't know how much are the volumes and so on, in some way we can extract information that are not so reliable on the CDS market. And on the other side, just looking to the CDS, we are not able to capture the implied, uh, let's say, guarantee produced by the government to these different institutions. Because if I'm a bank, and uh, clearly the, uh, there will be my government that will save me in case of default, the cost of the CDS will be lower because my probability of default will be lower. So the CDS will be affected by this implicit guarantee by the government. And clearly, this is not what we want to capture. We want really to understand how risky is the bank. Uh, for the sovereign, clearly we would like to have something different than the CDS market to extract this information, but uh, right now they are still working to produce a model, but it's not working so much. So in this case, the expected loss ratio is just coming from the CDS market, having the problem that clearly I claimed before, uh, maybe having implicit these kind of guarantees that they are offering in this case to the banks and so on. Uh, we still use the same approach as before, so Granger causality. And uh, we are then mapping the system and use different uh, network measure, the degrees of connection, the connectivity, the centralities, and so on. We use as a sample period January 2001 till March 2012. Again, we have monthly frequency because KMV is only producing this data at a monthly frequency. We are considering 17 sovereigns, 63 banks, not only European banks, but also American, so US banks and Japanese and uh, um, other banks, uh, and then 39 insurance companies, the biggest one. Uh, and we use, as, we, as I said before, the Moody's KMV credit edge expected losses. Uh, this is, for example, the pattern that we obtained for our measure of degrees. So how much, let's say, um, you have that uh, uh, you have you find connection from sovereign to all the other institutions on how much the other institutions are affecting sovereign. So as you can see clearly during the period of 2007 2008, you have that banks and insurances do affect more. It's not okay. I'm moving. Here. So you have that banks and insurances are affecting more. So the red one is higher than the blue one, but they. The other financial institutions. And uh, if you want really to see how much you know is a bank to sovereign and how much is sovereign to banks uh, and how it is also the building up of risk from sovereign to sovereign, well you can see that the picture is uh, uh, you know uh, quite telling us that clearly banks are affecting largely sovereign mostly in the pre previous period of the, let's say, the, the classical crisis from 2007 till 2009, and then we have after, you know, the, uh, the Greece, Papandre Papademos told us that uh, Greece was not producing good numbers, and, and then you have all the other kind of uh, uh, effect, you have that clearly the sovereign crisis do spread around. And if you're looking again on how much risk has been pull out by sovereign, in this case not just sovereign but the gypsies, so Greece, uh, Ireland, Portugal, Spain and Italy, uh, versus the other, well again you see that the last part of the sample there is a huge spillover from uh, these, let's say, um, uh, countries to the rest. We are not surprised about this. And again, you know, if you are looking how much they are central, we dis do see that even far before, these different institutions were quite central to the system. Even, you know, also during the previous crisis, so during, let's say, the 2007-2008, we do see that clearly sovereign were already in some way paying some role in uh, spreading risk around. 
this is the pattern that you can generate by just you know, mapping all these kind of connection. So in this case, the black are the sovereign, the blue are the insurances, and the red are the banks. Uh, for the significant uh, connection at the 1% level in this case. And as you can see, you know, it seemed that in June 2007, there was a sort of uh, polarization. So red is highly related with reds, and blue are largely related with blue, and maybe black, that is the sovereign. But the number of connections are not also so, so much. But if we move just in March 2008, this is the picture that we are obtaining. So, as you can see, the system is becoming really highly interconnected, and uh, you have that not as before, banks are taking and managing, you know, spilling over their risk among each other, and insurance belong to another world as, as well as the sovereign, but they're all together spreading risk and affecting each other. This is August 2008. Again, you see, there is this huge connection, and we have Greece that uh, start to show up and spread risk to the system. It's August 2008, and uh, so maybe it's just by chance that we are obtaining this result. I don't know, but this is what the data are telling us. For example, this is December 2011, where you know there was the, uh, the ECB that say, okay, I'm going to uh, continue for uh, three years to give you money uh, at the 1% level. So it seems that in some way the sovereign risk has been reduced, but this is the picture that we obtain. Again, uh, there is also, and it is interesting, that clearly move in some way far away from uh, the European sovereign that uh, in some way continue to spill over risk among each other. But we still have that, uh, it's, it's not that we continue to see that, uh, you know, insurance companies are out of the picture and the main problem is just between banks and sovereign. March 2012, this is the last part of the sample. Well, again, you know, we still have this picture. Unfortunately, you know, the one that I'm uh, showing as at the center is Italy. And again, we have this polarization of the different sovereigns. So, you know, here we have on the top US. So usually when I'm showing this graph to uh, my colleague in the US, they are very happy, you know, because they feel safe. I don't believe on this, but anyway, uh, is uh, at least this is what is coming out related to these other uh, institutions. But again, you know, I think that the, the, the message that we are getting from this kind of analysis is that there is a huge number of interrelationships between uh, uh, banks, insurances, and sovereign. And clearly, we need a model to understand why we are observing this and in which way this kind of risk has been spread around. Just to so open in it. You know, this is the measure that we are having, you know, just using this uh, sample period use this regression, controlling for heteroscedasticity and all the things that you can control, you are finding this connection. Then why you are getting this result, you know, I, I will be very happy having a model able to produce dynamically this kind of connection. So it's a symptom? It's a symptom, yes. Uh, and again, you know, if I'm just opening this part of the picture, as I anticipated to you before, we are at the center, and uh, you know, we do affect a lot other uh, sovereign institutions, sovereign debt, uh, and uh, also, you know, banks and uh, uh, insurances. If again, we want just to look as a picture as before, this was the picture that we find at, uh, uh, in June 2007. This is the picture that we observed in March 2012. Again, we are showing connection with a p-value equal to 1%. So this is the level of significance for a time series of 36 observations that really we should have standard error that cancel everything. 
in terms of, in fact, at the beginning, when we get this result, I thought that we were doing something wrong. But I check everything in Excel. So, you know, I'm sure that what is coming out <laughs> is really <laughs> significant. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, Again, you know, if you are looking also and go closer and look to this kind of connection, you, for example, here, the black one over there is Goldman Sachs, that is affected by this black part, just to, to give an idea. Then, okay, this is just a, for fun in some way. Uh, there is this paper by Schambach that say clearly we are talking and seeing now three different of crises. The one on sovereign, the one on banks, and the one on microeconomics and growth that is not, you know, we still observe a reduction in the GDP. So clearly these three are affecting each other and create connection and so on. So clearly we just add to this framework the uh, industrial production and see what is going on. So as again, industrial production is highly, is the the green one here is highly related with each other and is affecting clearly some of the risk, not so much. But look to the two bullets at the center of the graph. And these two bullets are uh, Spain and Portugal. So, you know, uh, clearly we are mixing different sorts of data, so maybe it means nothing. But, uh, Seeing a graph like this and seeing that clearly there is a huge relationship with the, this, the, the, what, how the industrial production is uh, going on in these two countries and how this is related to, you know, to insurances, um, banks and sovereign risk, well, maybe we can start to think about. Um, this is just to opening and seeing what is going on. And for example, uh, the, the blue, as you can see, insurances are also present, not all of them, but some of them, for example, Generali is one of the closest here, is the GIM. Then, you know, what is going on if we are not using CD, you know, these expected loss, but we are looking to the changes of uh, the expected losses, where we still find this kind of uh, connection. What about if we use directly CDS data? Do we observe the same pattern? So in this case, we use data on, from data stream. We know that for CDS data is a mess because you know we uh, the data are very not so nice. Uh, for I don't know how many of you works with them, but it's really most of the time they are not moving. Mostly, if you're looking to the period from 2003 till 2007, uh, but you know this is the kind of data that we have. And uh, if you want just to compare how different is the implied expected loss from the CDS price and the one produced by KMV. So I just take you know, an index for all the banks and I calculate, let's say, equally weighted in this case, the expected loss among all the different, my, uh, let's say, 63 banks. And I did the same using the CDS uh, price. Well, you know, you can see that the pattern is quite similar. Remember that the KMV is coming from equities. The pattern is quite similar, but, uh, you know, both during the crisis of 2007, 2008, or 2009, and also in the recent part of the crisis, you can see that clearly the, the, the expected loss from KMV is largely higher than the one uh, you know, implied by the CDS. And the same applies with a different pattern for insurances. So the relation with the spread is the exponential law you wrote, right? Yes. Yeah, the club is a very simple, yes, yeah. it, you are just calculating the, the, the expected losses from, from the price of the debt, if you want, that is related to the equity in one side. And for the CDS, just inverting the formula. It's very simple. Maybe we can use some more complicated model, but, you know, it's just getting the feeling of... Uh, so why the expected loss on CDS for banks and other financial institutions are lower than the expected loss of the KMV? Well, discussing mostly with Merton in this case, well, his point is that clearly there is this explicit or implicit guarantee that the government provides that clearly is not priced in the market. But if you're going then to see what are the connections that we are able to capture from CDS rather than looking to the expected loss of KMV, well, you know, the pattern 
we still find connection even in this uh, uh, using CDS. Uh, the pattern again of the number of connection is quite similar. There is a huge difference during the 2008 crisis, but for the rest uh, is, uh, is similar, but is more amplified. So it's larger the number of connection from KMV than the one on CDS in terms of from sovereign to sovereign. This is the graph that we obtained in June 2007, quite similar to the previous one. We still see you know, a difference between insurances, banks, and the rest. But this difference remains. You know? So again, you can see that banks are one group, and insurances belong to the other groups. And then you have sovereign that do affect these two institutions in different ways. Again, August 2008, we still have that the sovereign part of them will be more polar, polar, polarized. But still, you see that there is a huge difference between banks and insurances in this framework. And again, in December, you know, Spain seems that is not playing such a big role, is not so relevant. And we still see this huge polarization between banks and uh, uh, insurances. Uh, this was the one that we get using KMV data, just to you know, show the difference. Maybe you didn't remember uh, what, what, what we were sh showing before. And uh, again, for March 2012, we still see this polarization. The number of connections are lower. Maybe most of the connections are between banks and sovereign. But uh, you know, the, the part of insurances is not showing up so much compared to what we find using KMV data. Uh, so just to conclude, and then clearly I will be very happy to uh, listen your comments and also questions and so on. What this analysis is showing us is that the system of banks, in, the, in this case insurance companies and countries, in our sample is highly dynamically connected. I'm stressing dynamically because you know this kind of connection is not stable uh, for one group of institutions we do find that is constant through time. For another group, we have that sometimes it's showing up, some other times it's not showing up. Um, so this is why uh, we think that it's really important to try to figure out how through time, so risk, it has been spread around, and what is the path-dependent process that in some ways is under this kind of empirical evidence. On the other side, and this is making insurance companies not so happy, is that insurance companies are becoming, from our point of view, highly connected with the rest of the system. And I think that if you are thinking what they have in their portfolio, uh, you know, they do hold sovereign. So clearly, we need to think also to these other institutions if we want really to, to, uh, to impose a sort of regulation that is not only for banks, but we want to revise the regulation also for this other institution. And on the other side, clearly we show how one country is spreading the risk to another sovereign or to banks and so on. But the key point again is that network measures are able in some way to show on one side, some early warnings and assessment, at least, of how the system is complex. And you do have some connection that you're not expecting if you're just looking, for example, to balance sheets or some other classical measure of you know, direct connection that you may have among these different institutions. Thank you very much. Um, interesting story, uh, unconvincing, um, let's say, evidence for the last claim of uh, predictability. I did not see any out of sample or ex ante analysis. I saw the rephrasing of a well known story from a different cart with cartoons. Um, it's a bit harsh. It, it's, it's a bit harsh. It's a bit harsh judgment. I apologize, but it's just to make the message clear. Um, so, and, and in this uh, integrated world, global uh, village, I don't see how more correlation is really an advance warning, especially given, for example, uh, if you go back to refer to my, my, my talk, where the great moderation 
actually was showing that indeed the, the wild diversification actually was uh, uh, lowering volatility everywhere and so on. So you would expect from the mechanism, for example, explained by Rama, that more correlation appears and so on. So the point of saying more correlation is necessarily instability is just uh, ex post rationalization. And I don't, I mean, I, I would love to, you to show me, to show us actually ex ante evidence of this. Also, just a very brief remark, um, because I, I, we are working at ET Zurich a lot with the largest reinsurance company, with 33. And uh, already in 2001, they realized the interconnection. They realized that actually, uh, due to the terrorist act, they had to pay, of course, significant uh, payment for the claims. And they could not, or they had a severe problem because of the stock market impact. So they realized that indeed everything was connected and this was an eye-opening event for them. And it was like uh, 10 years ago, not just 2008. So this idea that actually the insurance are connected through market and together is already 10 years old through uh, this kind of event. Uh, but, uh, you know, the part that I showed you about uh, hedge funds, banks, brokers, and insurances, this is out of sample. So, in that case, you do have this kind of, uh, uh, let's say, predictability out of sample. So, you get that institutions that were highly connected in 2005 are those that are losing more in 2007 or 2008. Uh, we clearly want to do the same analysis for this part. Uh, but again, you know, on, on the other side, the thing that we show already is some evidence in 2008 of something that clearly we are realizing, or most of the people, you know, realized in 2010, 11, or 12, is get, giving us some hope that maybe we are able, you know, to, to find something. On the other side, I would like to stress that we are not measuring correlation. We are measuring leg correlation that is not completely the same, you know? So, uh, and it is something that we are not expecting at the monthly frequency. So I'm happy, and if you are able to explain to me why it is obvious that we are finding this, I will be very happy to know. Uh, but, uh, you know, even the model that it has been presented before, uh, I will be happy if he's able to produce this lag correlation with one month frequency. Uh, he's able to produce and I'm, I, I buy his story, you know, that this uh, binding capital requirement can generate this kind of, uh, let's say, state dependencies. I would like to see how much is generating path dependencies with this kind of, of effect. And on the other side, you know, I know that we are increasing correlation through time, but if we know this, why everything has, has not been, you know, included in the price today, and we need to wait for such a long, you know, for one month to see this kind of, uh, of connection. This is the key point that is uh, uh, on the back of this uh, thing. Regarding insurances, I, I, I agree with you that we know already for a long period that these ins insurances are not living in their own you know, small uh, world that is not affected by the rest. But for example, we went to OECD to a con conference organized just for insurances. And when we claim that, you know, be careful, not all of you, but some of you maybe are highly interconnected with the rest, they say, no, 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 this is not true. We are not belonging to this framework. There are only few of us that are clearly are not really insurances. So we stay in another world. And you know, on the other side, regulators, so for example, here in Europe, we are discussing on having a, a, a unique, actually not discussing, we do have already that the ECB will be the supervisor of all the banking system, but what about insurances? We still have that uh, the, the regulation of insurances is at the national level. We know this for 10 years, but this is the state of art. So just, just one comment, um, uh, well, two comments. One is that I think there is a possible way out of the apparent paradox between low frequency and high frequency because 
this is very common in uh, dynamics and even in uh, not only deterministic dynamics but also in stochastic dynamics or stochastically perturbed deterministic dynamics. Uh, it's, there are fast and slow variables. I think there are fast and slow variables in, in finance as in many systems. Certain market variables can be very fast in responding, others may be slow. For example, you are forced in your analysis by the use of KMV to go to monthly data, otherwise you could go, you could go to sh shorter uh, time scales. Uh, this is actually related to a little research project that we have started because, which was really prompted by people in the Unicredit who asked us to look at the problem of interpolating somehow uh, default probability matrices which are provided with low frequency. So we started looking to the dynamics of CDS and also of bonds because I think that when you don't have a single, when you have a single currency but different balance sheets like in Europe, if you don't look simultaneously to the dynamics of bonds and CDS and you try just to use CDS market data to get implied probability of defaults, then you are going to, to have problems, not only because there is the implicit guarantee, but really because you, you can, cannot see any flight to quality phenomenon in your data. So I urge you to consider this. But I think there should be a link between several, maybe not many, say three or four variables, slow and fast, uh, which explains part of the apparent paradox. I really would like to talk about this. The second question is, I, I just wanted to go back to one of your slides, because there is something which I don't understand about 2010, because 2010 seems to be very quiet in your graphs, and uh, it was already the onset of the sovereign, and this is something which I don't understand very well. It may be related, by the way, to the fact that I don't know the data by heart, that maybe exactly using bonds, you have an early warning that you don't get through CDS, I don't know. By the way, CDS are a very strange product because, for example, in the case of Greece, they were completely sterilized. So I really wonder what is the present status between operators? What do they think about CDS? Is it something that is going to be paid if Italy or other country or Spain is ejected by the euro or not? Or we just have a new president which is dimensioning Demissioning as it happened for the CDS, right? So, I mean, new president of the international the derivatives. The CDS? The CDS and Greece has been paid. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, well, uh, then, then, then I wasn't informed. So, it has been paid yeah, sure. fully. Yeah, it was a, was a, was a meeting on to the, the 19th the, of March the, of, the, of, the, of the ISDA uh, where they eventually decided that CDS would be, that would be triggered. So, they did. Okay, okay, well, then, then. It was considered a restructuring event, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I, uh, okay, well, Fabrizio, and then I have a yeah. question. I, I have um, two, let's say, technical questions. So the first one is, do you do the Granger causality test by pair, or the old, all the variable with all the variable? And do you think this, you obtain the same, do you expect the same result? I think the form, you did the former. But uh, do you think you obtain the same result if you do pairwise uh, testing rather than doing all, all the variable against all the other variables? And the second question is, is okay, I, I'm not an expert about this thing, so you are better than me. But I think that there is, the, 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 you, at least in the first part you were saying that you were controlling for um, factors in general, right? And I guess that if you change the factor that you control, you get very different results in some sense in the network. Because a way of generating, I, I, I can imagine, but maybe I'm wrong, that uh, a way of generating lagged correlation is if you have uh, one factor and the two variables are fo both following the factor, but with a different strength, and then you can use one of the two to predict the other one, to, to the one who follows more the factor to predict the one that follows less the factor in some sense. So if the dependence on this factor is increasing with time, then you expect to have more links. But maybe this is wrong. Okay, this is just. Yeah, yeah regarding the fast and low variables, yes. I would like to know which one they are. Uh, regarding the 2010, yes, uh, we are surprising too, and uh, clearly, you know, this is why we are also looking to changes because in this case we find something different for this part, and clearly, this is just 
preliminary results, so we need to go deeply. Uh, we, we are surprised too about this. Uh, we are doing the analysis by pair, so we, because having a windows of 36 observation, you cannot do, uh, the only thing that we did is, you know, we add these common factors, and then one thing that we try to do is to add another, so a third, let's say, institutions, uh, and, and look to the highest p-value. So when we find really uh, a connection is because it's not driven by a third one, but is uh, for this one. Clearly the number of connections we find are lower, but you know, pretty much the kind of structure that we obtain. So the one that are you know, really strong there are there, whatever is the other variable that you are using. And uh, again, for the controlling factors, you know, I can really, sh we have a, a picture in the paper where we are adding, you know, not only financial factors, but also, you know, inflation, uh, interest rates, macroeconomic factors, and so on. And then actually adding other, other factors is helping us to reduce the standard error of our measure, so we are increasing the number of uh, connections that we find. Yeah. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> Well, we, we had this discussion during the, the coffee break, but I would like to make it public. Uh, the, so, uh, obviously, I mean, one of the reasons why you see this rise is that you have certain periods, I mean, like regimes where you do have this interconnection which is uh, popping up, and other periods where uh, it's much less evident. And as soon as uh, those period or regime uh, appear in your statistical period, then you see all these uh, the rise in these uh, interconnection. If the if it's out, or if it's just you know marginally in, uh, you you see it disappear. Now uh, you know you can see a change of regime as a, an econometrician. You know, saying you have a, a clock, and sometimes you're in one regime, sometimes you're in another regime. Uh, I'm a dynamicist, so I prefer to see it from a dynamical point of view, where you have uh, certain background dynamics uh, with some noise, uh, which you can also interpret as fast variables. And uh, at certain periods, the dynamics dominates. And at other periods, it's more the diffusion dominates. And uh, so when the dynamic dominates, uh, the, you, you see uh, these uh, things appearing. Uh, because the dynamics are really marked, and in here you have, uh, because you are looking at causality from A to B, but exactly, I mean, what Fabrizio was saying, that uh, if you have one big factor that produces the dynamics, and therefore A and B become extremely correlated, you will not be able to distinguish between uh, the, it would be an epsilon, you know, the fact that the return of A is explained by the past of A or is explained by the past of B is just at random. Mm -hmm. So you may very spuriously see that it's explained by the past of B, where just, it's just the fact that globally you have this overwhelming of the dynamics. I mean, I don't think that there is any statistical method that uh, in that, that, that will make you the difference between A causes B, B causes A, and both of them being caused by a third C, uh, which even can be even uh, much more lag than the, than the two, that you know, impact with different time uh, delays, and so that it, it gives you the impression that A is produced by B or B is produced by A. Yeah, so clearly, it is an issue of timing, but uh, of course we are also controlling for the lag variable. So if this, the two variables, so if the two institutions will be affected with a lag by the same factor, then you know, controlling for the lag uh, of the institutions, I'm able in some way to try to reduce this effect. But clearly, if through time you, do, you will have that there is this kind of impact that is different, then yes, I, there is no, no way. But again, you know, it will be very nice to understand what is the mechanic that is generating, or maybe what is this factor that is you know, generating this kind of effect. The last question? Yes, just, just a small remark about data, because your, your interest in works in much, da much data driven indeed. So uh, uh, it's about the use of, as, uh, your work seems to rely on really on a strong hypothesis, on your equity, say, debt, uh, CDS. Uh, you seem to put on the same floor these three different market segments. Uh, 
So I was wondering, why not that, I intend bonds, and uh, why not to rely more on CDS? And then maybe a remark, uh, you know, CDS are issued and traded by banks. So it's likely, it's, it's likely to be a particular sector. You know, you, you won't find a, a corporate issuing and edging a CDS. So it's more or less reflecting the inter-network banking in itself, in its very quotation. Not too much, maybe, about, about the sovereign. Because sovereign, CDS on sovereign, are clearly edged and traded by banks themselves. So that, you know, a kind of feedback, it would be hard to explain. understand the question. So you, your point is that given that CDS are traded by banks, maybe there is also an issue about, uh, uh, let's say, um, counterparty risk. So, this is your so, point, so, yeah. That, that's, so, my point. That's, that's my point. Yeah, well, you know, all this issue about counterparty risk, if you are analyzing, uh, you know, there is a huge amount of words on CDS and how much is this counterparty risk. But there is really a paper by, actually, a series of slides by Darrell Duffy that you do shows that, you know, if there is any counterparty risk in the CDS price of other banks and so on, is very low. So it's not able to justify, you know, this kind of difference that we are able to capture here. In other kind of risk to come into your network. Uh, because, you know, you're, you're, you're putting on the same floor equity and debt uh, uh, reminds to me the General Motors situation in 2005, maybe 2005, I don't remember so, but where equity versus debt trades uh, were really decoupling so much. So in the, in the abstract Merton model, you see, uh, let us say, a, a perfect situation when the threshold is ruling uh, asset liabilities. But in reality, you do, you do find some decoupling. Yeah, but you know, uh, first of all, there is what is called the CDS basis. So if you have a difference between the bond and the CDS is also driven. And we know that during the crisis, this basis was very large because, you know, you cannot do this arbitrage. And even for the sovereign, there is this uh, basis that actually is the opposite of the one that you observed during the 2008 crisis. But again, you know, also because of this basis that is showing that there is a difference between the CDS and the bond that is in this case more related to what is going on on the equity, so they are more related, I trust more on the result on equities rather than on the CDS.